thank you all. Uh, welcome to Philadelphia. Um, I want you to know we're going to be taking questions at the end, so um, store up your best questions. Um, and I'll just start in, and uh, we'll go from there. So, so Dan, you run a company that's 75 years old, and you're, you're the largest healthcare provider insurer in the region, in the Philadelphia area, southwestern PA. And, and I'm wondering, what is, it, what is it about the company that's different from a, pay, from, a, from a member point of view now than from 10 years ago? Well, Carl, that's a, that's a great question. First of all, thank you for, for having us here. I was sitting up top looking down, and I see a lot of iPads and a lot of uh, iPhones, and you guys can multitask, so I, uh, I'm trying to learn how to do that. I think it has to do, if you're an innovator, you need to multitask. Um, but when you, when you think of Independence Blue Cross, obviously we're one of the uh, 38 Blue Cross Blue Shield plans across the country. Uh, we are the branded entity for five county Philadelphia, and we have an unbranded business, Amara Health, which is in 22 states and the District of Columbia. Um, I would say what's changed over the last 10 years is that healthcare has changed. Uh, the blues overall have consistently been the insurer of last resort, have been the insurer that have been uh, intricately involved with the communities they serve. Uh, uh, the people that run the Blue Cross plans tend to be from the region where they, they provide the services. I would say over the last 10 years, and this is frankly a compliment to, to our competition, uh, the large publicly traded entities have become much better at really touching the communities they serve and being more connected in a local way. So it's brought about more competition than we've seen in the past. And, and frankly, in this era of healthcare reform, uh, competition is a good thing. And I would say that's the major change over the past 10 years. Okay, so we're facing the largest change in healthcare in a generation with, with the uh, expansion of Medicaid and also the exchanges. I wonder if you could take it one piece at a time. So the exchanges, um, it turns out that your competitors, United Healthcare and Aetna, have not really, really not really going to jump in immediately and are going to hold back a bit. And yet you've prepared to really jump in and, and really commit IBC to. So what is it that you see that they don't? Well, I, again, it gets back to my, my earlier point that the blues have always been part of the communities we serve. We've always been the insurer of last resort. Independence Blue Cross, in addition to a, a wide range of commercial products, has always been in the Medicare Advantage business, has always been in uh, children's health insurance programs. We've always been in Medicaid managed care. Well, when we looked at the exchanges, and, and certainly there's the different metallic levels that will be offered, uh, the different products within the metallic levels, we thought it was a lot like the businesses we've been in traditionally, Medicaid managed care, dual eligible business, Medicare Advantage business. So we're very comfortable in that space. And there are some uncertainties, uh, whether it's pricing, uh, whether it's some of the uh, requirements of the Affordable Care Act. We just felt that this is where we, we belong. And uh, so we went in, we dove in with both feet. We have products on each of the metallic levels and, and a number of variations with each, within each level. So, so with the exchanges then, I mean, you know, you've got, you've basically got a whole new element starting and most people don't even know, and something like 40% of the American people don't even know the law is the law, and some 12% think it got repealed. So, and, and it's key for you to get young people to sign up young people. So what kind of, what kind of ground game do you have to really get this point across? Oh, well, Carl, I think the word ground game is, is the appropriate term. If you think back to the last two presidential elections, uh, aside from all the attributes that President Obama had in terms of his speaking ability, the way he engaged with the public, uh, the Obama campaigns had just an incredible ground campaign. They used technology to pinpoint where vote the vo their likely voters were. They used technology to pinpoint folks who didn't vote, but if they heard their message, would vote. We've taken that, and we're applying it to this time of, of health care reform. And so we have pinpointed by neighborhood uh, the, the, the young folks, let's say, for example, who, who maybe in the past would, would not get coverage or their company isn't going to provide comfort, coverage anymore. And we have come up with, uh, whether it's sitting across the dining room table or at a Starbucks or at other, other community center or a church, engaging them in a dialogue about first what you said, educating them about what the Affordable Care Act means, what their options are, how they access these options and make a decision. Uh, we're using mobile apps to, to get the word out to folks. We're going to baseball, Phillies baseball games, for example, and we set up a, a large van. We have a number of our associates that are there, and you'd be surprised
surprised at the number of young people who are in that 40% category that you referenced who aren't familiar but, but realize they have to make a decision. And our, our goal here is that uh, the penalties are not high enough that if, if a young, invincible person, 27, 28, says, you know, I don't need, I can forego health care. The challenge for us is convincing them that by joining one of the plans, whether it's through the exchange or through one of our, our individual products, they begin to develop a medical home and begin to develop a pattern of care that over the long haul will keep them healthy for, for the remainder of their lives. So, okay, so you're going to have this war I guess you're going to have like a, it sounds like almost like a war room and a ground game with, with, with the exchange. Now, what happens, though, about, about the Medicaid side? You know, you, you came up through the Medicaid subsidiary. You worked, I guess back then, you were 50-50 owners with the Sisters of Mercy, yes. which, which should give you an in with somebody. I'm not sure who. But <laughs> now they're not longer in the picture. But, um, and you're in 22 states, you said. And, and you've got a lot of states out there that are doing Medicaid expansion. Pennsylvania is not. New Jersey is. You know, how do you read the tea leaves of Medicaid expansion, and where do you think it's going? Well, if we can take a step back and, and you think of the reason reform really came to the, the forefront and eventually the law was passed, when you have nearly 50 million Americans who are uninsured, the pressure that that brings to bear on the rest of the system, people uh, uh, showing up at emergency rooms and the, the cost of uncompensated care for providers. Well, in the past when there was Medicaid fee-for-service, even though people were covered, they were not involved in, in a medical home. They did not have a primary care physician. They did not have a network of support from their insurer or clinicians or health systems. So two decades ago, we, we believed in conjunction with uh, Mercy Health System, Independence Blue Cross and Mercy Health System, that we could develop a, a product line and, and really engage states in developing managed care models that really work for that population. For example, um, there's, a, there's a high incidence of, of teen pregnancies for the Medicaid population. Well, it's important that you get them involved in uh, prenatal care, regular doc visits, uh, a nutritionist, whatever it might be to help along the, presence, uh, the pregnancy. Also understand some of the other socioeconomic uh, issues that the, the, the young woman is facing. We couldn't connect with them early on. We tried sending a certified letter. Nobody ever opened a certified letter. We tried uh, reaching them in other ways. Finally, somebody came up with an idea where we would have our caseworkers go out and simply put a bib, a bib on a door that had a phone number, call for prenatal care. All of a sudden, the, the, the walls were broken down, and we realized once we made contact, once we built a trusting relationship, once someone realized they had a medical card like anybody else in this room would have as a, as a commercial member, they had a medical home, they had a primary care physician. It began, there was a, there was a population that now understood that they had the ability to manage their care with the support of this, of this network. A number of states got into the business. So fast forward to the Affordable Care Act, and part of the Affordable Care Act, as you know, increases the, level, the poverty level for folks who are eligible for Medicaid managed care. We have proven over the years that A, the quality gets better, B, people get access to quality care instead of accessing it at the, at the emergency room. Uh, C, it's cost effective, and states save money. So we're in the forefront of doing it. Uh, and, and the blues traditionally haven't been in it, so now we're partnering with other blues around the country to really go in, respond to RFPs, and, and in many places we can build the same model that we've built here in, in the Philadelphia region in these 22 other states. So in those 22 states, how, how prevalent is a Medicaid expansion? And, and is that, is that going to drive your, your decisions in the future? Uh, well, and, and Carl, what, what you're referring to is governors and legislatures making decisions to accept the additional money from the federal government. I would say 90% of the states that we're in, roughly 90% of the states that we're in, have chosen to accept the additional money. And, and uh, obviously, this means several million more people will be eligible for Medicaid. In the states that do not accept that money, it doesn't impact it those doesn't impact those who will be eligible for the exchange and get a subsidy on the exchange. So I think most of the governors across the country who accepted it realized that what it meant they'll be able to get 
more people who access care through emergency rooms, through community urban or rural community-based clinics into a medical home and into a pattern of, of managed care. So in the last week, we had a, we had a news flash where um, the, basically the government is delaying the penalties on large companies to, to show that they have insurance. And, and some people are interpreting that, that the law is in trouble and that, that we, we, we may not even see the law. I mean, how, do you, how do you see things? Well, we, we made a decision early on not to politicize the issue. Um, even though, frankly, if, if you think about a lot of the rhetoric that, that occurred in Washington, not only in the national debate, but in state legislatures, uh, people who do what I do weren't really seen in a positive light uh, by government. Uh, including the existing, our, our current president. Well, this is nothing new for journalists. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Carl. You're pretty popular around. But um, uh, so, <laughs> so the way we looked at it, there was need for reform. Again, 50 million Americans uninsured. It means other parts of the system, including innovators, have to pay for the care that they receive. So we've been a strong proponent for for some type of reform. What the Affordable Care Act has done, it, if done correctly, if implemented correctly, will give more Americans access to care. This is a good thing. Uh, what we say, that it does not address the, the cost issue. So the problem that, that, that we see going forward for the plan, unless we as the private insurers, unless the use of innovation, different innovative products, different innovative processes, mobile apps come into play, where we improve quality and drive down costs, it will be a failure. In terms of the, the initial startup phase, we believe the portions of the plan that are still in place, the setup of the exchanges, uh, the taxes, the premium taxes that we as insurers will pay, the other regulations other than those that they've delayed for small businesses and for the large businesses will go on as scheduled. And there will be, there will be a lot of disruption in the marketplace and it's incumbent upon us as the insurer, the individual clinicians, providers, and government to find a common ground in solving the startup problems that I guarantee you we will see. So, so the exchanges start October 1st. Um, do you foresee that you will be the only game in town, or do you foresee that there will be competitors you know, on that website? I think ultimately, it's, it's hard to say whether in the end our current competitors will make a decision to, to join. The, they haven't done that in Pennsylvania as of yet, all of them, that is. Uh, I think ultimately, if the system gets up and is running, if, if people of all economic backgrounds, of all uh, uh, areas of, of, the, of, of the region are able to figure out how to access and how to sign up for a plan, I believe the competition will, will, if not in 2014, beyond, will be part of the exchanges. And we always say competition is good. Okay, so you've got a room full of innovators. Um, what, what do you look for in innovation? What really works for you? What, what kind of things are you looking for? If, if, if I'm an innovator, what, what, what would I need to get your attention? Okay, let, 25 words or less. Oh, I can't do that, Carl. That can I, can I have more than that? Yeah, okay, go. thanks. Well, here, here's our thing. We, we uh, about three years ago, invested in a company uh, called Navinet. We had started Navinet with uh, two other Blue Cross plans and some private equity money. Navinet, in essence, was the portal, a physician portal for claims processing. And then we began to message back and forth using Navinet. The private equity folks wanted to get out about two years ago. So we decided, uh, Independence Blue Cross, that we wanted to be the largest investor. We found two other blues who, who agreed to partner with us, and we went out and found a company by the name of Lumaris. Some of you may be familiar with Lumaris. Lumaris was started by the same folks who started WebMD, MD on. Um, uh, Kleiner Perkins was, was behind it through, through John Doerr, and a, a, a CEO by the name of Mike Long. Well, they weren't just about partnering with us to do this physician portal. They wanted to do more. They wanted to use the tools they had developed, accountable care tools that bring real-time data to all points of care so that we could develop together. Payer, individual clinician, patient, our member, health systems, to have the real-time data to do care pathways that were of the highest quality and the most efficient. So as we got into this, 
The physicians we talk to are really excited. As we develop these patient-centered medical homes in the area, people really got into it, and we began to say, all right, we're on to something here with innovation. So through our friends at Lamaris, we took a, a, a trip out to Silicon Valley. And, and ultimately, what we learned out there is that, man, it's an amazing place. We toured Google. I could have stayed there a week. I would have played volleyball, swam in that lap pool they have, all that stuff. Our but food writer says the food is really good. Food's so. unbelievable. You, I, there, I think it's like you can't be 40 feet or 100 feet away from food at any point. And, it, and it's true, and it's good food. So when we came back, you think about Philadelphia. How many folks are from the Philadelphia area, if you don't mind me asking? All right, a critical mass. So we began to say, think of Independence Blue Cross, think of all the health systems, think of all the major universities, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we believe it's the best in the world, some of you may have a different view, uh, University of Pennsylvania, Thomas Jefferson Health System, Temple, Hahnemann, and so on. We thought, and we have a, a, a whole innovation corridor along Market Street. We began to say, you know what? We'd like to be the catalyst, Independence Blue Cross, the catalyst for making the Philadelphia region the center of healthcare innovation in the country. So now that you might say that's a bold statement, but we, we realize it's a collaborative effort. Our mayor is really high on this. He's gone to Silicon Valley a couple times. We want Philly to be the hotbed. So we said, okay, how do we make this happen? So we started, is that 25 words? That's good, that's good. We, we started by having what we call the IBX uh, Innovation cha Game Changer Challenge. And what we did, we brought in about, we had 100 plus, 150 applications. We picked three businesses. And these businesses came, we gave them inc some incubator money, not a lot. We helped them with training on how to bring their business to market. And we said, okay, if we help, we would like an opportunity to A, either use the product as part of our network, engage in a provider contract, or if we really liked it, we'd like to have a minority investment in the building, in the business. So here's an example. We have a company, a One Doc Way, 27-year-old Samir Valik, comes to us with this idea. You know, you look at rural communities, and, in a, and, and there are some outside of Philadelphia, for those of you who aren't from here. Well, this, this secure system that you go on the, the web, secure system where you have a face-to-face, -face basically, visit with a, uh, a, a behavioral provider. Well, really, this has opened up doors in these, in these regions of, of the area. It's an innovation that's working, and this business is taking off for this young person. And he, by the way, invested, his parents are investors in the business. So it's that type of innovation that, A, we can use it for part of our marketplace, B, it really speaks to improving the quality of care, and then C, ultimately it'll drive down costs. Because we believe, because that person had that secure website, they went on that website, and they had a face-to-face -face conversation with a healthcare professional. It may, in some way, uh, avoid some type of emergency situation, and frankly, get them on a path to healthier care. So we said, okay, this is a good start. We've, we've now, we're going to open our innovation center two blocks from our building at 17th and Market. And we said, how do we really uh, bring, bring this to the market? So we went to Penn Medicine, and we partnered with Penn Medicine and a company called Dreamit. And we had applications from all over the country. We selected 10 uh, incubator companies to come to Philadelphia. They had to move to Philadelphia, and they have moved to Philadelphia. We provided them with $50,000 seed money and then also a boot camp where they learned about how to, the business pieces. Innovators, many times, you know, you got to make that connection back to how do you build a, a business plan? How do you reach out and market your service? And those 10 companies have moved to Philadelphia, and if they get up and running, we'll stay right here in Philadelphia. The beauty for us is if, again, it contributes to our ability to better provide care to our members, to improve the quality of care, and to drive down costs, it will become part of our network. And it will be a built-in business for these startups. And two, if we really believe in the idea, we'll be a minority investor. So 
Okay, we're going to start taking questions in a few minutes, so get ready. Um, so you, you've got an accountable care organization. You're trying to, so you're doing a lot of, a lot of uh, data and you're doing a lot of population management. And I, I guess my question is, is it, it, does it show any signs of paying off? And if I'm a member, what, what am I going to see that's different? What's in it for me? Okay, so let's, let's start with informatics. Um, we, we believe that at the heart of really managing care is having the, the data that you need, the real-time data that you need, being able to understand that data, and having the connectivity with all points of contact in the system so that together you can manage one patient, one member, or, or, or a group of patients, a population, whether it be by disease state, by socioeconomic background, whatever it might be. So it starts with the information. We invest it in building that informatic, informatics capability. So now, as an individual, let's start with at the business level. We can go into, whether it's through the broker or directly to a business, and give them a, pro, a real time profile of what's happening with each individual. Again, HIPAA, it's HIPAA compliant, but what's happening with each individual and the population of whole, as a whole within their business. You can do it with an individual as well. So people begin to see that, hey, I am slightly overweight, and, and by the way, I've got to quit smoking, and um, I, I, I could be headed towards uh, diabetes. So all of a sudden, we say, okay, use this mobile app. The physician has all that information. The mobile app makes sure that they maintain their meds, gives them tips on, on uh, nutrition, on uh, getting out and exercising, all those types of things, Meeting, going to their next well visit, whatever it might be. So the difference for a member is before you try to navigate in the dark, now the sudden, because we're sharing this information, this real-time data this, that tells a story, not only with, other, with the clinicians in the health systems, but with the member, you're, you're part of the game. You understand you now are part of the solution in becoming as healthy as possible and ultimately driving down costs. Okay, any questions? Yes, right here. Oh, sorry. Where do you see the ultimate equilibrium falling between, you know, what payers do and providers do, say, five, ten years in the future? What does that relationship look like? You know, I know you guys hired the hundred nurse coaches uh, and are, you know, pushing your medical home model. Um, that's traditionally been a provider area, and providers are also asked to bear more risk. And so, in your view, where do you th see things shaking out five, ten years down? Okay, I, that, that's a great question. And, and I think you have to, I think it's going to continue to be acro across the board. And at this end of the spectrum, you have uh, the prior, uh, I, uh, Dr. Blatt mentioned uh, Kaiser, for example, where they're on both, they're completely on both sides, payer and provider, and do it extremely well. Or Highmark. Or Highmark. Highmark being a newer entrant in that marketplace being a, a blue insurer, but also acquiring a comprehensive uh, uh, health system that, that Carl certainly you know a lot about. And then even in our backyard, Geisinger, up in the, the northeastern part of and central part of, of Pennsylvania. So you're going to have those. And then on, on the other end, you're going to have the insurer and payer, whether it's because their marketplace, they're, there's enough um, competition of both payer and provider that they can do what they've done traditionally. I would say, because the, what, the things that you mentioned that we're trying to do, we fall in the middle. We're not going to go out and acquire a health system. Frankly, we can't afford to do it. Uh, we're not going to try to do the things that clinicians do well. We see ourselves as enablers, as whether it's through the, the innovative technologies that, that, that you come up with, uh, of, of building a system where we work with providers through accountable care organizations to achieve the, the same goal that Kaiser, Geisinger, uh, uh, UPMC, frankly, and, and Highmark are trying to do, and that's to give people better access, higher quality, and drive down costs. So the, the short answer is I think people are going to dabble along that spectrum in different ways. Some will fail, some will succeed, but there will be very few that will go as far as the five or six or seven or eight who have done it comprehensively to date. Just my Great opinion. question, great question. Do we see another? Yes. Nick. 
first. Hi. I'm um, <laughs> curious about your response to uh, Mark Blatt's presentation just now. I, I find myself just dying to see a digital pilot in which the digital natives who are really much happier with the convenience of a clinical consult electronically could even pay out of pocket for that and not take off for work to run to the doctor's office unnecessarily. Well, I, I think I like Marcus Welby a little better than he did, but um, I, I would say this. He, he kept referring to providing care 10 cents on the dollar. I heard him say it several times. I, I don't know that that's possible, but what I do know is the whole digital piece, the whole um, being able to go online, like I talked about the behavioral interaction, and, and to really find out, hey, what's ailing me, and, and how can I remedy it? Um, so there's a place for it. And I think he's, they're on the right track by saying more of it has to become accepted and utilized in, everyday, in the everyday practice of medicine. I don't, know, I don't know if it goes to the extreme that he's laid out, but I, I think it's a pretty exciting dream. Um, uh, we tend to believe that it's a combination of the traditional medical home. Uh, people still like to look face to face with a, uh, a primary care physician or a, a nurse practitioner and really develop a relationship, a, a trusting relationship where that person, that human being can help them navigate the system, become healthier. And uh, so I think it's a combination of both, but, but I think he's right on target. That, that the use of technology and uh, basically a virtual interaction between the system and a patient, it's, it's part of the future. Is that? Yes, sir. You. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Uh, I've been a physician in the city for 37 years. I, I like to congratulate Independence Blue Cross. I think you do an excellent job um, working with the community and, and providing needed services. What frustrates me, though, is sometimes I think uh, our politicians really can't see the forest for the trees. When these plans go into effect, one of the biggest problems I face now for my patients, even for my family, is getting access, getting a, an appointment with a physician. Uh, my wife needs to see a gynecologist because hers retired. Uh, even though I'm a physician and have friends, it's a nine-month wait. Um, you know, for many specialties, if you call up any of the, our major hospitals here and ask for an appointment, again, it's many weeks, if you're lucky, most likely many months. If we're going to add these millions of new people under the Affordable Care Act, it's wonderful to have these systems in place and this technology in place, but if the actual patient can't get access to a physician, A, what good is it? B, one of the answers seems to be, well, let's lower the expertise, let's have a physician's assistant, an assistant to a physician's assistant, assistant they're seeing, but at below some point the care is not worth it. So how do you see this okay. problem working out? Have the politicians given it adequate thought? Well, I, I'd like to park the politicians for a second, and, and let's say that it's a combination of, of making it easier for you as the individual clinician or a group of clinicians to practice medicine. It's about where appropriate using uh, alternative uh, practi nurse practitioners or other, again, to a point. Uh, and then third is, is bringing technology to bear. And so what we're trying to do is say, and, and we've, we've had success, uh, roughly 70% of our five county network, uh, uh, primary care network, is part of our patient-centered medical home program. And what we've done is we are assisting these practices in scheduling, in scheduling such a way that if someone has uh, uh, what they would consider an emergent or, or they need to see a physician right away, we help the doctor set up uh, scheduling patterns so that individual can get in every day. And we're saying, leave some, leave some of your, leave some of your schedule open. We'll fill it with these folks and we'll help you, you make it work. So it's that interaction between us and the, and the provider community. And then again, it's, it's using technology, using data where appropriate to help you better serve your members. When it gets to specialties, it is an issue because of the, the, sheer, the sheer demand and, and the number of specialists that we have in the region. So we're hoping to apply that same type of patient-centered medical home to the, to the specialty areas and giving you as a clinician, so your wife's primary care physician, can through a same type of approach that we're using with primary care, help her access the gynecologist 
sooner than a six to nine month. I think we got time for one more. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, just picking up on the theme of referring to Dr. Blatt's comments, um, he alluded to a model where you essentially decouple, I think what he was alluding to was you sort of decouple primary care from the rest of the healthcare system where people are paying for primary care directly because it's inherently inexpensive and easy to predict, whereas specialty care and more complex care is what you have your insurance product for. Um, which parallels to things like uh, car insurance and that sort of thing. Uh, my question, I guess, is do you see that model as making sense in healthcare space? Do you agree with it? Where do you see the challenges with that? Well, my, my answer probably is predictable, but I, I would say no. I think the, the principles of, of, of managed care uh, really involve the entire network of care, including primary care. If you decouple it, decouple it, Decoupling means that there's a lack of connectivity between what the primary care doc does and the rest of the system does. We're saying the answer to the quality and the cost issue is doing the exact opposite. Bring everybody into a more aligned, a more connected system so that there's easier interaction from primary care to these various specialties. The part I liked of what, about what Dr. Blatt said, you can do it with, with the support of technology and other means, you can drive down the, the cost, the cost of the primary care piece, and ultimately, I believe, drive down the cost of specialties as well. But I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not, we're not for coupling, decoupling, we're for further integrating. Um, we're done. Thank you for the very thoughtful questions. Thank you. Thank you very much.